Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's episode 77 of the Alfie Wattam Technology Podcast. Thank you for following and subscribing on, on Spotify and all of that good stuff. Um, as per usual, before we kick off, we are, of course, sponsored by WeLoveAlpha.com. If you are a software developer open to new opportunities, or if you're an engineering manager looking to scale your development team across the UK and Ireland, then check out WeLoveAlpha.com right now to register a job with us or to register as a candidate. Um, today on the podcast, I'm joined by a returning guest from a couple of years ago, Mr. Jamie Gordon. Jamie, thanks for uh, joining us. Could you give us a little bit of an intro, mate? Tell us who you are, what your, your background is and, and that sort of thing. Sure. Um, for a period of time, I was actually um, head of development at uh, Travel Trade Group. Uh, we were kind of like an intermediary um, for um, between uh, lastminute.com and some other big brands out there, such as Secret Escapes. And uh, that was a very interesting role. Um, got to see what the travel industry was truly like um, underneath and under the hood when it comes to tech. And um, I mostly have actually been freelancing, um, even during my time during COVID and that role, I was also freelancing as well. So um, I have a variety of experience from all different industries. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming back on the show. A couple of years ago when we had our last conversation, it was more focused around kind of top tips for junior developers and people starting mm -hmm. out their careers and that sort of thing. So the people that are in that camp search Jamie Gordon on Spotify, you'll you'll find the last episode, you'll be able to get those top tips and, and advice. But in today's um, podcast, I was keen to get your perspective into a couple of interesting things that are happening in, in the world of tech at the moment. So without further ado, um, let's kick off with an article on CNET. So to bond with humans robots are learning to laugh at the right time it almost sounds like an episode of black mirror or, or something but it's <laughs> no joke scientists are now teaching robots the nuances of laughter got a gif there with a um a robot doing its thing so anyone who's shared a laugh with a friend knows how deeply bonding humor can be so it stands to reason our future robot companions have a better chance of winning our trust and affection if they can laugh with us but just just because a robot tells jokes doesn't mean it can respond to them appropriately. Did a comment warrant a polite robot giggle or an all out <laughs> bot belly laugh, play on word. Uh, the uh, the right response could mean the difference between an approachable Android and a uh, metallic bore. That's why Japanese researchers are attempting to teach humorless robot nerds to laugh at the right time and in the right way. Turns out training an AI to laugh isn't as simple as teaching it to respond to a desperate phone at tree plea to cancel a subscription. Systems that try to emulate everyday conversation are still struggling with the notion of when to laugh, reads a study published Thursday in the journal Frontiers in uh, Robotics and AI. Um, robots are laughing. <laughs> what do you make of all of this, <laughs> Jamie? Um, I think it doesn't take the, you know, every person, if you think people to begin with, I think um, people have personalities and therefore they laugh differently at different times and there's awkward moments and they're genuine occupant moments but if you create a standard model for all ai to work off it becomes really irrelevant then there isn't really any much personality to that i think um in my personal opinion they're trying very hard to get a standard model and really artificial intelligence is just really hard maths really when you break it down is statistical in, uh, in its, you know, use of data points and et cetera, et cetera, and machine learning through those data points. I think that as much as there is raw data, raw data does not give those kind of inflections, those um, moments that are very true to everyone's personality mm. um, because it is based on a certain set of collection of data you know, you'd have to collect so much data to perfect the model that I think it would be deemed illegal by <laughs> <laughs> governments, you know, um, to be truthful, because we, we ourselves, um, our identities on the internet, etc., are very important. And I think this is where there is a fundamental flaw with AI. It in inherently takes all our flaws on board as well. I think that's kind of where you know, teaching it to laugh, it's also taking our flaws <laughs> yes. with it as well. 
So, I mean, we can get, I don't think, if you've ever seen um, the Will Smith movie, um, I, Robot. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, and if you think of that, it was artificial intelligence. They, they had three or four different laws and they all eventually, when they converged, they all contradicted each other to protect humans. And then it was against humans freedom. So it's kind of like, it's, it's when we, uh, when, when AI decides that statistical analysis and that convergence is kind of very important. I think that's where we're, that's where Elon Musk comes in and says there's challenges with it. But I think getting human emotion, it's only surface, surface level. And when we think of that new version of AI uh, art that we see all over in TikTok and everything. Like, like Dali. Um, it is quite... I would say it's divergent. Yeah. It's meant to fill in the gaps, but it is quite divergent, if that makes sense. And I think that that's why you see a lot of them have dark spaces and holes in the in the imagery, because it's trying to fill in the gaps from our abstract words. Whereas we're very, very, because we have personalities, et cetera, et cetera, we're very, you know, creative uh, and I think that's kind of very hard sure. for statistics to actually analyze. A lot of people I have on the podcast when it comes to the, the topic of AI, um, they constantly talk about the fear that um, if we add fake emotions like laughter and, 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 and you know, that suddenly the robots are smiling and then they're, they're crying and, and who else, you know, and the AI gets more and more complex to the point where it's passing the Turing test with flying colours every single time. How will we know if an AI is 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 sentient or, or conscious or, or, or not? What we will do eventually is that science will eventually create the next version of that test, mm -hmm. I believe. I think it, it will, the, the, once Turing has passed, Turing didn't, Turing knew a few things, right? But it's actually, cert, it's just applied certain types of mathematics. You know, his background was kind of from that, right? Yeah. yeah. Because there didn't, like, there was no such thing as computers right then. And then eventually he ciphered through mathematics, there were ciphers to basically determine, you know, uh, what we know about the World War and uh, World War II. Um, and so it, it gives you an idea of like when the maths catches up, the next generation of very smart geniuses will come up with a theory with computational mathematics. And I think, I think where it comes in is when we get to quantum computing. When quantum computing starts to come into the home, I think that's when AI truly will we'll truly have a test for AI. We're actually using it on, a, you know, the model that we've created computers today. Yeah. Quantum computing will change that. Quantum computing and quantum data uh, storage as well will come about. Um, so, I mean, we are on, as much as people say, they're on that trajectory. Uh, you got to remember what we actually run that thing on. Um, and so therefore when that kind of model changes, that's going to change as well. So they're, they're thinking about not just quantum computing. If you think about uh, AI, it can think far faster. It can for, think four things at a time uh, or up to eight things at a time, I think it is. Sure. Um, in terms of bits. Um, so, I mean, mathematically, it can do a hell of a lot more. Yeah. The difference is, is the data it consumes. It might not have enough data to consume, and therefore the, 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 the model it would create for AI would be very small in terms of machine learning. And I think that's one of the challenges where they're talking about the, um, you know, the, it doesn't seem very genuine. Yeah. It will become genuine once it passes the the quantum test, which I, well, I call it the quantum test anyway. That's my own personal opinion on it because that's where technology is eventually going to go. And that's when AI kind of succeeds, but it needs, like I said, enough data in the background to make it yeah. very nuanced, essentially. Um, and it also has to read us. That's the reciprocal part of it. So AI, 
may not consider what we project and therefore it is very um, kind of uh, it you know over time as children we learn from our parents we watch what they do mm -hmm. you know sometimes we take on their habits so it's kind of like that when it comes to ai ai has to learn Hey, it's going to be interesting, man. In a couple of years, having a laughing robots, what, what you know, amongst us. I, I, I predict in, in this decade that they'll be, um, you know, used in in certain applications and, and use cases. But um, one, one to, to to keep track of. Um, the, the the next um kind of article that that's worth discussing is all about the the wonderful world of Dev itself. So, so JavaScript is no longer the favorite programming language for developers. TypeScript is now the number one programming language which among developers, according to techradar.com, uh, a new report revealed JavaScript is no longer top dog when it comes to the world's most popular programming languages. Uh, CircleCI's uh, 2022 State of Software Delivery Report found that TypeScript is now overtaking JavaScript to the number one position, uh, topping one of the biggest names in the industry. The company said the change is likely down to its developer friendly features, like allowing them to catch similar errors locally and to commit working code more frequently compared with JS. Um, interesting one. I, I reckon if we did a survey based on the usage, JavaScript would still come out on top. I, I'm assuming this is more based on um, people learning that that as a, as a, as a technology. But um, yeah, uh, the reason being is uh, JavaScript by its own makers realized that there was no kind of middle ground mm -hmm. and therefore TypeScript was that middle ground because everything was object oriented. Whereas uh, scripting languages such as JavaScript were not object oriented in that way. So, I mean, like PHP is object oriented, um, .NET now is object oriented. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of different changes now in terms of the technology, but uh, funny enough, uh, it has to transpile back to JS to work in your browser. So um, yeah. uh, that's the crux of it. We're not going to escape JavaScript. And I think um, the two major companies that drive this are Apple um, and Microsoft, mm -hmm. because they're part of the W3C. Um, Mozilla Corporation, which also are based in the US, ironically, um, they themselves are also another driver of, you know, um, better JavaScript and TypeScript, I suppose, um, and documentation around that. But I think that, you know, when I was hearing about they're going to move away from HTML, we haven't actually done that. We've got HTML5 now sure. um, after five or six years. Um, and before then you know they were talking about everything just purely written in javascript um that's kind of sort of true mm -hmm. it's a mixture of both actually a fusion of both now when we see frameworks such as vue.js react but they all just work with um javascript and typescript ironically yeah. because they both compile into javascript at the end of the day i think that um where things will go is that they they might eventually change the the internet away from JavaScript entirely. Uh, I uh, I think that's it. it runs JavaScript runs practically everywhere, in, including the apps that you have on your phone on an Apple iPhone. You need to use bits of JavaScript um, and um, HTML syntax basically to, to set out how your um, screen looks. So I think that there's there's different challenges before we migrate away from that. But I think that with more powerful technology as a computer's advance, I think that uh, we will eventually maybe make things a little bit more simpler for ourselves. And there will be like an internet 2.0. I know there, uh, well, 4.0, I think, yes. with web 3, I think. So <laughs> I think the 4.0 will come about when web 3 matures, I think, yeah. Do do you, do you think Web three because Web Web three is, is often hailed as as a combination of of the, the metaverse with, with VR and AR combining that with with crypto and NFTs and blockchain and just about anything exciting that they, they, they chuck into Web three nowadays? But um, do, do you think Web four would be on the metaverse, or do you think that would be back to back to Web or a combination? Or I well, well the the, the challenges are integrating that at the moment. I mean, there's JavaScript that uses, you know, Solarity, uh, 
solidarity and everything. Uh, solidarity. Yeah. I can't say the <laughs> word, sorry. It's so new. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think, look, uh, look I, I'll, I'll say where, the, the, where things are when you're talking about blockchain. And I'm sorry, I'm going slightly off subject here. Okay. But um, I was looking last night, I was doing a bit of research. The, uh, there's been mass layoffs mm -hmm. in the blockchain industry in America, uh, in some parts of Europe, which have surrounded their tech industry in this new tech. Um, and there's very little entry levels now in blockchain technology worldwide that I can see on the internet when I was looking through it. And I think blockchain is very heavily tied to uh, our economies uh, right now. It's ahead of the curve. So it's in deep recession before we're actually noticing the recession. And I think that uh, it's, it's more volatile as an industry. And I think after two or three of these kind of big recessions that happen in the industry, I think it's going to um, upset a lot of people. Mm. Uh, because uh, it, it's how deeply it's still tied with us in terms of it was supposed to be this new revolution, a financial revolution, a technological revolution. I think that our hopes were pinned too much on it. And when I invest, when I divested from it, it was about $200 for Bitcoin, and realized it wasn't really, I think it was over, I personally feel it's a little bit overhyped. Mm. And that explains why the price is now deflated. I personally think that it will take not a decade, like they said it would, to mature. It will take two or three more decades for it to really mature and really have a solid foundation. It does not have a solid foundation right now because it is so tightly coupled to the economy. It would take governments to actually get, or a lot of governments to get on board to sure. make this happen. But I don't see that happening with regulations. So I think that when it comes to JavaScript interacting with this, I think the, the, the internet will move on. I think the internet will move on and therefore the technology will have to move on. And therefore there's going to be one big massive fork coming down the track, I think. And I think that's particularly good to say because when quantum computing is about 15 years away, I would say, and in about 25 years away from actually being in our homes, um, I would definitely say to you right now, um, what we have right now, it's, it's not perfect. Uh, it's imperfect. And I think that it's going to have its own challenges. Yeah, the, the quantum revolution is just gonna gonna change everything. I think that's um, yeah. that, that, that's a no-brainer. But that's um, yeah, it, it, exciting when it comes out. Absolutely. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, Jamie, is um, over at Uber, and um, they're investigating a cybersecurity incident after a hacker has breached its internal network. So on Thursday, Uber confirmed that it's responding to a cybersec incident after reports claimed that a hacker breached its internal network. Uh, the ride-hailing giant discovered the breach on. Thursday and has taken several of its internal comms and engineering systems offline while it investigates, according to the New York Times. Um, Uber said in a statement given to TechCrunch that it's investigating the incident and is in contact with law enforcement at the moment. Um, the sole hacker behind the breach claims to be 18 years old. He told the Times that he compromised Uber because the company had weak security. He used social engineering to compromise an employee's Slack account and persuaded them to hand over a password that gave them access to Uber systems. It's the popular uh, tactic in, in recent hacks um, of big companies. Um, and he uh, Uber employees received a message that said, I announce I am a hacker and Uber has suffered a data breach. The Times reports uh, he also wants Uber drivers to receive higher pay as well to, to, to add to it. Um, but um, yeah, what, what what do you make of this, Jimmy, an, an 18 year old hacking into one of the I biggest mean, tech, tech companies? in history? I think it's I think, well, 18 year old makes sense um, when you think of uh, Extinction Rebellion. Yeah, I mean. Th that particular generation is is going to <laughs> they'll do anything yeah, yeah, they'll do they'll do yeah, yeah. um no obviously i'm at the tail end of that generation and yeah. um and i would say you know growing up i think i think the difference is they're they're keen about their activism a lot more 
and social engineering, I mean, if you know how to do it, it's, it can be done. I mean, anyone can really learn it. You know, it's a skill that can be learned, you know, um, and, you know, I, I've, I've even seen social uh, engineering attempts on myself. Oh, yeah. From when, uh, because I'll explain, I'm at, when Avast is, uh, uh, or ABG as they're known, um, they basically have a tool that allows you to scan the internet for okay. your email and passwords. Yeah. And I uh, have been suddenly listed on the, the dark web oh, uh, myself. Um, and uh, because of through email links or links from database leaks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you're on this podcast right now, I'd suggest do that today uh, because you will learn a little bit about social engineering. It, it will make you aware that you may actually eventually get social engineered to someone will try and socially engineer something, you know. So someone was trying to scam me because they used, uh, they said, oh, I have pictures of you from the webcam. And I'm like, oh, I get those emails too. Man. I don't <laughs> think that uh, has happened. And firstly and foremostly, I have a Mac. Yeah, yeah. The person who tried to do the social engineering did not know I had a Mac. Okay. And you see Macs by default always have their light on, but yeah. security and protocol that uh, Apple have. Mm. So very hard to get around that, you know? But uh, you, you've seen Mark Zuckerberg, you know, even take the uh, the webcam and put the tape over it, you know, and everything. Yeah, I've seen his pictures yeah. of his desk and all of that. Got duct tape on it, yeah. Duct tape and everything, you know, but it, it gives hackers opportunities then to um, prove that you are them and, you know, take photos and, and things like that and try to do that social engineering. Now, obviously, we don't know what's happened with Uber and this employee that yeah. the social engineering has happened. But the likely thing is it's been an internal email that has suddenly been hacked sure. and then eventually uh, password then, um, you know, they fished, basically used some phishing um, to do Slack and then they got the password, they got in Slack, then they went and did the next thing. It's all about different steps. Yeah. Just getting up the steps and up that ladder. I mean, it, it, it can be done. Um, it's just, if you're motivated, uh, you can do it, but it's, <laughs> trust me, as in, as we know, this person has got caught. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's the danger of it, of it. Right. But I mean, I, I, I feel like I could, if I really wanted to, despite never hacked anything in my, in my life, social engineering doesn't seem like the hardest thing in the world. Right? I just no. need to make a, a fake Slack homepage, make sure every, all the data that's inputted into the username and password gets, gets sent to me. I can see it. Um, and then once I log in, it, it, redirects them to the actual slack that they've got no idea that they clicked on the wrong link in an email or an update your password sort of thing it doesn't seem like that hard to to, to, to really set up so d despite all the all the advancements that we can do in in, in cyber security and, and protecting people um like will social engineering ever go away because it, it seems like it can't really if i think the dark web is going underground even more now um, I was reading about how much authorities are really seriously cracking down on dark market websites now. And uh, there's an article, if you went onto the internet, that says, uh, why are dark market uh, websites retiring? Mm -hmm. And they're pulling out these um, end scams, basically of taking all the money and laundering it, etc., and just closing down the market as an end game. Um, um, some have tried to come back um, I know one or two have um, but I feel that the dark web that kind of part of the dark web I think it's it's now dying um, and therefore social engineering and the information about social engineering is eventually being weeded out I think because it's less accessible. Eventually over time, I think that when the authorities eventually succeed at this, um, it poses definitely our <laughs> challenges for us and our privacy. Uh, but at the same time, I think that it will eventually, this is why this 18 year old got so easily caught. The authorities right now, especially when it comes to the dark web where things were very illicit, things are really seriously being taken seriously. There's billions by the American government and 
Five Eyes governments basically yeah. collectively going and putting all their power. And the EU now have put the full force of their government and everything behind this as well. And they're doing and they're succeeding because that's where the majority of the internet traffic goes. Mm -hmm. It's through those territories. That's what we're most actually consume. The rest of the world doesn't consume because the speed of the internet is not as fast in other countries. That will eventually change in the next 10 years because satellite technology now, which is in Elon Musk's SpaceX, yeah, yeah. Um, that will all change. Um, and so, you know, we've just seen Apple announced satellite SOS technology now. Anyway, uh, Apple 14, uh, I, yes. 14, Apple phone iPhone 14, sorry. Yeah. So I think um, when it comes to security uh, and social engineering, these activists will only be active for the next 10 years, I think, mostly. Um, there will be always activists, there will always be those types of people, but the information to educate that next generation, very hard to get a hold of, I think, unless you went to university or we were taught by another hacker yourself, and went on to a hacker forum forum but i think that some of that illicit stuff it's it's going to be either so suppressed it's very hard to know yeah. and access i think uh to the general public i think that this is where things are going to change and this is where governments are turning the tide on this so you know fraud is a multi multi billion down billion pound or dollar industry if the governments can tackle that the banks get a win Mm. you know and then that's a, that's a benefit to society as a whole actually in a sense even though it's not so great you know <laughs> yeah no, absolutely okay cool well, well look thanks for um coming back on jamie it's good to get your opinions your perspective your your insights into, into what's happening in the world It'd be awesome to to get you back on again perhaps in, in, in a couple of months mm. and um, have another conversation but yeah just, just yeah. wanted to thank you for coming back on mate thank everybody for listening today it's of course Wednesday, uh, as we were recording, um, so happy hump day for people watching it on, on the date that it's gone live. For, for those that are watching it a little bit later, make sure that you're following on Spotify to get updated. We've got almost daily episodes coming out at the moment. So um, for all of the latest tech news, insights, expert opinion, commentary, et cetera, et cetera, um, check us out on Spotify. And, uh, and thank you for watching. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks. Um, did